Hello and welcome. You're tuned into the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. Tim Dennis has some time off. He'll be recouping and taking care of himself as he's going through some more of his medical issues, folks. So continue to pour out the love and the, the caring and support. Make sure you stop by on his Facebook page and Twitter page and let him know that you're thinking about him. It's always nice to hear from our friends all around the world. we got a great show lined up for you, something a little different tonight. And uh, joining us for the remainder of this hour, we have uh, Tobias Churchton joining us. Uh, Occult Paris, the lost magic of the Belle Epoque. Uh, did I say that right, Tobias you you said the name of the book well, but my name's Churton, not Churchton. <laughs> what did I say? Oh, geez. See, it's always one thing or another. Church. <laughs> all right. Well, it's good to have Church. you with us either way, Mr. Tobias. We'll go with that. And uh, it's at least you'll class up the act on the show a little bit today. So thank you for joining us. Uh, great pleasure. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Now, boy, what a pedigree you've got going. Um, what draws you to this type of, of topic? And I know you've written some really interesting books, including the, the book about Aleister Crowley in Berlin. I'm, why is your focus on this aspect of history? Well, I think we need it. I think we need to know these things. Uh, the, it's just this, what you might call the esoteric spiritual history of humankind has been generally presented in sensationalist terms and uh, basically it's like going into a tributary you come off the mainstream you get into this stuff you go a bit crazy and people think you're a bit odd to be interested in it um, and a lot of that has to do with the way the subject's been represented in the past uh, as as uh, something akin to ghost films or something like that uh, my aim is to re-establish the spiritual understanding of life um, uh, in a ma- highly materialist era, so I'm really tilting at, at the uh, at the nature of our times. I'm I'm I'm, I'm suggesting that uh, we haven't got it all right, and uh, we need to know the facts. And my my position on it is to give you it, give it to you straight. What really happened? Uh, my work isn't sensationalist, and yet the subject of it is extremely exciting. And uh, I work on the basis that intelligent people find the truth more exciting than a pack of sensationalist exaggerations. I would agree with that. However, you know, us dumb people really like the scary stuff, too. So it all works out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'm not at all. No. I'm just teasing. With no, you. No. Having, mm. having a little fun. Uh, talk to me about this occult Paris. I mean, when, I don't know, and, and maybe it's again our limited uh, scope when you think of the occult and, and, uh, magical practices and such. Paris is just not the one place that would come to mind for this type of, uh, work. You know, maybe parts of England, uh, some of the early America, but Paris just seemed to, to be kind of a surprise. That's why I was interested in having you on to talk about this book. Isn't that interesting? Yes. I suppose when you think about Paris, you might think about fashion, you might think about the French Revolution, um, the underground or something. Uh, but in fact, of course, if you think of the influence of Paris on the arts, uh, on painting, sculpture, Picasso lived in Paris, he didn't live, he, he spent more, you know, he, the bulk of his career is in Paris. So the idea of place where free thought and a free spirit is celebrated. Where is that coming from? What What is creating the cradle for all that creativity? And my contention is it was a very small group or groups of people in the 1880s and 1890s um, who created, through their interest in magic and opening up their minds, uh, created and worked with and were of enormous interest to the artistic community. So Claude Debussy, who surely you would imagine as a major figure of Parisian art, uh, used to meet at the um, the bookshop of Edmond Bailly in the Rue de la Chaussée d'Antin. And there he met Eric Satie, another composer, and many authors. And they all wanted to know, what, what is there more to nature than what the scientists of the time were telling them? And Paris then becomes a, a, a place to integrate scientific knowledge with spiritual knowledge. Paris also had been through a revolution since the 1850s, and the Industrial Revolution had hit France and was encroaching on Paris, the ugliness, dirt, noise, and fanatical money-making of that period. And this occult movement was saying, 
as an important magazine that promoted it said, uh, materialism has had its day. In fact, of course, materialism was approaching perhaps its its highest point and, and very much is still with us. But they resisted. They said, no, the inner life of man is all. The imagination is the place where human life really is watered and resides. And so they create they turned they created a new kind of paris underground which became overground the movement was kind of killed off in the first world war partly because many of its leading people were either killed in the war or died of broken hearts when the german barbarians uh, knocked into france and, uh, and uh, with all the materials matériel shells bombs etc so that they could um so in that sense this movement um which in our time, as might be thought of as irrational, um, was subsumed in the 1920s beneath the artistic explosion that actually followed it, the explosion of surrealism uh, and uh, uh, Salvador Dali, a lot of people we think about from then. So the image of Paris has changed. But you only have to see a film like Gigi, a wonderful musical made delightfully in Hollywood and in Paris, and you get a feel of a very special time, what was called La Belle Epoque, the beautiful era, which ran up between uh, the 1870s and the First World War. So my book is designed to so you can dive into that world and spend some happy hours there. And I, I must say that's, to me, one of the great pleasures of the book, is to wander those streets and feel those people's minds and the imagination of that time. And, and, and it's, it's a beautiful, colorful experience. Now, many people hear the word occult and automatically the idea of dark arts and practices leap to mind. When you're discussing yes. the occult, in this book, give me a definition for what it is that you believe you're covering and what was going on at that time. Well, occult is just the Latin for hidden. So um, at a certain point, uh, you know, one planet can occult another one. Uh, it's, it's a perfectly innocent word that I think, especially since the 50s and 60s, has become associated with black magic, which right. means doing using magic for nefarious, selfish practices. And the word occult has been thrown about, especially by evangelical churches, as a catch-all for anything that isn't um, we believe in God the Father and mighty maker of heaven and earth uh, creedal material. So a lot of beautiful things have been chucked into the bucket of the occult. And in the common language, it's come to mean pentagrams, evil, uh, dark, dark arts. But the, the innocent, in the Renaissance, which is the source of so much of modern occultism, um, the word simply meant hidden knowledge, and hidden knowledge would cover pa- practically everything we now call science. So, in fact, the threat to the church of science is really what we're talking about. That's, that's the opposition to the occult is the opposition to knowledge. So occult knowledge is simply things that aren't obvious to us or that aren't automatically taught or that you have to learn through initiation rather than just picking up a book and it goes in, you know, straight in and you understand it. Um, occult knowledge has to be – it's a development of the spiritual nature of man to harness the powers of his own mind. The idea that, that magic exists around us has been around since – the dawning of time and people able to communicate and tell stories. And in most cases, as I understand it, magic is nothing more than science to some people that they just don't understand at this point. Was there, is there a thread of magic that exists? That is what many of us think of when we hear the word, something that's above science, something that's magical, you know I mean? That, that, that's actually encompasses that word. Yeah, well, I, science, modern science has limited its palette. I mean, even though it's, it, it seems very broad and, and nobody today could even know everything that's published in all the scientific journals of the world. But it, in some sense, it's narrowed its view to that which is measurable. So uh, modern science, Newtonian science, is interested in things you can classify, things you can measure, things you can weigh, and and information which comes to us through our five senses. And But historically, mankind has always been aware that the highest inspiration 
was independent of the senses. And specifically, magic deals with powers which have their root in the unmeasurable zone, uh, which in the old days would have been called the angelic uh, zone or the super celestial, which meant beyond, beyond the stars, or to do with the realm of God's own territory, as it were, the source of being. And harnessing this understanding is really what, what the, the Gnostic current is actually about. Occult, obviously, is a word now that's been so tainted. Uh, perhaps I prefer to use words like Gnostic, uh, which is the uncovering of spiritual knowledge. So it's a dimension of understanding which isn't obvious. How can you measure the mind? I mean, today scientists are trying to understand consciousness as if it was an object. Uh, but the things that are very dear to us, you can't put under a microscope or put a ruler against. So in that sense, they're not irrational. They just don't conform to current understandings of scientific method. Um, having said that, I don't see how you could possibly be interest in developing your inner powers if you don't also develop your outer ones so science as a as a discipline of mind is terribly important to to a modern occultist uh unless they're just pissing about really <laughs> <laughs> don't hold back how do you really feel tobias you've got uh the idea then that that there is something above us and and something that surrounds us that is immeasurable and this was something yeah. that, they, that they wanted to challenge with science. What were some of the practices or the points that they were most interested in exploring at that time? Are you, are you talking about the French occult revival that I'm talking about yes. in the book? Uh, yes. When you say they. Right, okay. Uh, well, well, they were trying to revive all the occult sciences. So the leaders of that movement, one of whom uh, was called Papus, Gérard Doncos, set up a magazine. And you can see from its cover, really, what they're interested in. They were they wanted to write articles and receive articles about Kabbalah, the Jewish mystical tradition, hypnosis, Freemasonry, theosophy, uh, magnetic healing, spiritualism, that's people who thought they were talking to the deceased. And really, he wanted everything, um, uh, not Gnostic initiation uh, groups, ideas, rituals. So they were, and they were into trying to practice some of this uh, stuff. The mode of practice in this period, 1880s, 1890s, had been really influenced by the development of spiritualism in America, uh, which had been brought uh, to Europe by people like Madame Blavatsky, who was founded of the Theosophical Society in New York in 1875. And this idea of coming together around a table and you might join hands and there would be a medium, someone who was particularly sensitive, and they might come out with some pronouncements and things like this. Uh, or there would be meetings where... Uh, there was no, suddenly there'd be an awareness that there was another power in the room or something like that. And th they might use um, methods of dangling a, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, could be an object of some kind on, on a chain, which would move oh, when it passed over sure. certain letters. Yeah, pendulum, of course. Yeah. Those were the, those were some of the methods that were being looked into. But you also had chemists. Uh, looking into alchemy and practicing alchemy, which is, you know, um, using chemical recipes uh, to promote, um, they were looking for elixirs and things like this. So he covered a lot of ground. I mean, and, and of course, the whole gamut of mainstream and fringe Freemasonry. Uh, so they, they set up study groups all around France, and these extended all the way to Turkey and to, to Egypt and to Russia where people would, would, would have meetings and they'd discuss their experiences of the paranormal, uh, whatever they might be. They were looking for any information that they could analyze that suggested that the universe was not solid atomic uh, as it was thought to be, that it, you know, it was not just a bunch of atoms piled on top of one another with no, as it were, <laughs> nothing else. That's it. It's matter is it. That was materialism. That's what materialism means. It, it, there is nothing but that which can be sensed and measured. And they felt that this was actually taking away the real uh, essence of man, uh, what really makes us special and, and, and uh, uh, potentially, potentially superior to the rest of the uh, vegetable, animal, mineral kingdom. Um, 
they were trying to stop mankind also from destroying himself by becoming a slave of his own thoughts. Uh, you know, a, de- a too heavy a devotion to science can lead you to some very strange conclusions. Adolf Hitler, for example, took Darwin quite literally and said, well, if the history of man is that the strongest shall survive through adaption and the weakest will go under because it doesn't adapt, then what's to stop us hurrying up the process and deciding which are the weaker bits and getting rid of them now? Uh, that's an application. I don't care what anyone, a lot of scientists will say, that's terrible, that's not true science. But in terms of understanding, it's, was, it had been erected as a scientific principle by the 19th century that that's what Darwin was actually saying, uh, that, that the fit, survivor of the fittest was the true way of nature and there was uh, that that's and you had to accept it whereas um, civilized minds are in my understanding of civilized were saying hang on if that's the way of nature our job is to use our intelligence to ameliorate this tendency of nature to bear tooth and claw and develop something far better and uh, while we work with nature and understand it uh, uh, try to understand it uh, we c- we can actually shape it I'm often reminded of this principle. I live in the English countryside, and as I look at my window right now, and I'm sure true of many listeners, they can. I see these wonderful fields and trees, and it didn't just happen like this. Nature didn't do that. That's the result of a thousand years of human cultivation. So nature and science need to be cultivated, and the way we do that is through knowledge and imagination and the creative powers that we have within us. And the essence of magic is to maximize that creativity on the understanding that creativity is a spiritual thing. It's not a a rational process. Reason is part of it. But there's a higher reason where old Newton getting his inspiration for gravity. All these many scientists would agree that the moment of breakthrough is, is a process, is, is a very, very extraordinary thing to happen to somebody. Inspiration, literally in the spirit. Now, I personally more interested in those principles, the principle of creativity, than I am in joining hands and, one, and speaking to the late, my late aunt Doris. <laughs> you know, um, I think there's, the, 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 there's a great deal of charlatanry on that side because people are vulnerable when their loved ones die, and there are people. Uh, who are always prepared to take advantage of p- other people's vulnerability. So occultism has a bad name on that score. But isn't that interesting, right? Because here we're talking about open mind, creativity, imagination. But in yes. a lot of cases, people are, are willing and easy to dismiss mediumship and that as charlatan, charlatanism because they, they don't understand it. They don't have the ability themselves. And I'm not taking a side either way. I just think it's fascinating that even when you know there are op- uh, topics that we cover on the show you know we'll talk about every strange nuance of of the supernatural and paranormal but then you get into certain aspects of it like fairies and people laugh and scoff and roll their eyes but to a, a section of the population that is as real as mediumship and ghosts and bigfoot and and anything else that people are are interested in and in researching and I always find it interesting where people draw the line of what is acceptable to uh, to believe or open your mind to the possibilities of and what is not. Yes, I think that's fascinating. I think what you're doing and what you just said is exactly what the group of people I'm writing about in the book were doing, is to say, well, are we going to throw the baby out with the bathwater? Is there something in any of this? You know, or isn't there? And they were investigating it in a op- open-minded and open-hearted spirit. And that doesn't mean that every single medium uh, is tainted simply because one turns out to be a fake, right. or three, or four. It may only be one in a hundred. But that's that. It, the principle is the same. If the ordinary laws of nature have have been traversed by in at some point. Uh, it only needs to happen once, and the law of nature is not absolute. And this is the kind of fight that they were fighting, and it's still going on today. And we, in fact, this conversation is all about it. Um, we, we are we are interested in the exception to the rule. Uh, the magical world is an elusive and a difficult one. Um, 
for some modern people to get a grasp of. They're afraid of being taken for a ride. Of course they are. It's all snake oil. Right. It's some, you know, it's, it's something being sold on the back of a chuck wagon to a, to a hungry and desperate public looking for, a, <laughs> you know, and all of that. It, it, that, that is true. I, I, I personally think that, uh, I mean, my education was highly rational. I'm a very rational person. I have trouble believing some of the things I believe. (laughs) (laughs) That's a conundrum. Yes, I, I'm, I'm my own biggest critic. You know, I can come back uh, and, and present myself with you. Oh, come on, Toby. Why are you into this? You know, why, why aren't you studying computer science or something like that? Because I think the imagination is primary. It's not, uh, there is a whole school of modern psychology which has suggested that the imagination is something to be suspicious of. And their attitude is very similar to the old churches uh, who were afraid of mystics because mystics claimed a direct access to spiritual experience without coming to the bishop or priest first or quoting the Bible. And and they said, we can't have that. We can't have people walking around thinking they're in touch with God without our authority. And this is what we, t- the real battle today is this thing about authority. And the scientific uh, establishment who've taken over practically every university and where, where they're not actually running it, uh, the influence is so enormous through politics, through the media, through education, especially what children are taught, um, that the voice of the uh, the spiritual development lot, the we visionaries, <laughs> is is deliberately um, deliberately sidelined and suppressed. And it, I often think, you know, I'm fighting a losing battle, and I, I may be, um, but I'm sure also a lot of the people who resisted domination by communist atheism under the Soviet Union were in a similar situation. I feel personally exiled. While there is a lot of freedom in the Western world to believe what you like, believing is one thing, but uh, b- creating a culture which reflects those beliefs uh, is, is, is something else, and, and there isn't as much freedom there as we might imagine. I ran, an, at university, yeah, I ran a university course which had been accepted as an academic course, Western esotericism, uh, but there were a great deal of people in the university who said, why are we running a course like this? Uh, to MA level, surely this isn't serious. And, you know, I, I said, well, uh, 200, 100 years ago, they wouldn't have thought English literature was a serious subject. For 250 years ago, you couldn't study history at university either. They would have said it was a it was simply not a suitable subject. But if we go back 400 years, science couldn't be taught right. as a separate subject. So we, we go through these periods of intense fashions, and whoever's in charge at the time always thinks their empire is going to last forever. My view is that, that, that mankind, especially through the communications we have today, honest people will come to understand that there is another way of looking at the whole thing which has its own validity and beauty and which appeals strongly to certain minds. And I would argue that these minds it appeals to are some of the finest minds our species has ever uh, had the pleasure of witnessing the people I write about in occult Paris are really beautiful people. I mean, the, not only some of the greatest poets, Malame, uh, some of the greatest musicians, Debussy, Satie, uh, some of the greatest painters, uh, Moreau, um, some of the greatest theorists. They're people you would just love and swoon to be in their company because of the beauty of their inner lives and their ability to express it. So. Uh, I want to raise the Titanic of this period, and let's see it. And I try to, and that's what the book is about: is to recreate it in in, re, its re, in its reality. I don't think you can pass through the company of these people through the book and not come out thinking, "Hell's bells! They they knew something. They'd got an idea. This is good. We can go with this." And that's the point of the book for me: is to is a, as a creative seed. And um, do you think that it, it the reason just, it's so easy yeah, to so, dismiss? ideas like that is because they'll also look at other aspects of, well, you know, they believe this at this time as well. And we've already proven that's wrong. And people believe that this would, you know, and and they've been able to disavow so much of what we've thought we knew in the past that it's like you brought up earlier, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. If, if they got all this wrong, they're probably wrong about all of that as well. So that's why it's so easy to sweep this kind of thought process and belief system under the carpet. 
Well, of course, it works entirely the other way. Half half of the scientific theories have been disproved and now laughed at. You know, when Pasteur, Louis Pasteur, first talked about his microorganisms and so forth, uh, many scientists laughed at him and his conclusions. Uh, science, in fact, creates more of its own heretics than the church ever did. Uh, you know, right. there is, you know, so the idea that science produces stable knowledge is ludicrous. So it's in fact what it isn't. I, I, I watched a a very scientific abstract program on TV last year, and there were four people arguing for the true nature of the universe, and they were all scientists, and they'd all got PhDs, and they all got funding, and one of them thought it was like this, and the other thought it was like that, and other thought, I thought, okay, that's that's fine, you've all got your views, but in what what gives you then the authority to say that this ain't, <laughs> this right. ain't like that? You know, it's it's not a stable system of knowledge science, but it's a it's an attempt to produce one, and one which I very much support. Um, but I think science bit the hand that fed it. Uh, magic was the was the was the formulation in the Renaissance which gave science its beginning. It was the first principle which said man can look into the universe. We have the mental capacity to embrace the cosmos. This was a magical principle. It didn't come out of a, an equation or a science textbook. Uh, the, the, be- the beauty and the search for knowledge through nature and what is beyond nature which they did understand in those days, there was that which you could know uh, empirically and there is that which you can only know spiritually. As St. Paul says, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Um, Now, At at this time, if I could ask one thing, you know, it's interesting. At at this time in our history, it would appear that more people are turning away from the theologies of church and ideologies of church. They're finding issue with them. We're, we're considering it a, an almost an age of enlightenment to many people that are turning away from the church because they they see that maybe the edict that the churches have put forth are more self-serving than the religion that they stand for. And yeah, I, wonder, I mean, this is, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. believe that that might open up a new renaissance movement towards, you know, kind of this reimagining and, and the possibility of magic? Or do you think that, in a sense, religion needs to be there for magic to to exist as well. And I say that because there's the Bible. I, I, I'm always fascinated by people that quote the Bible and talk about all the evils that men do and how you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. And you brought up the fact that the bishops and the cardinals and, and the church uh, leaders would say, no, 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 we can't have them just running around feeling that they can do this on their own. They have to <laughs> come through us and get our permission or our authority in order to do such things. But in the Bible itself, Christ, uh, Jesus, and and you know many of the leaders have said you have these abilities within you. You just have to employ them. You have to ask for them. You have to bring them forth. Much of the Bible, to me, reads like a book of magic. That that it's there, latent within us. It's learning how to access that, and whether prayer is nothing more than the modality of meditation and silencing the mind, putting forth intention to the universe in order to attract what it is that you want, or we're really speaking to a large figurehead that is gracious and wears a white robe and has a, a grand beard and you know lets one football mm. team win over the other because he likes their colors you know it's it seems like maybe religion almost needs to be there to continue the idea of magic well dave you've almost answered your own question there uh and you, you've made quite a few fascinating points i'll try to uh, try to remember some and and give give my response to that um yes i do think that the uh, failure of the churches to capture the spiritual imagination of ordinary people uh, today is 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 an opportunity for what I call the esoteric traditions to become enriched through that shift, slight shift of, of of loyalty, if you like. I would be the last person to want to see religion as such torn down or removed. I, I think. It is a continuity which expresses the idea that man has a relationship with God. And insofar as it does that and continues the attitude of faith, I very much support it. I do not support the idea that the church actually understands itself. I think the church has very much lost contact with the interior knowledge that was present when many of its founding documents were formed. I don't think the modern church 
leadership suggest, suggest to me that they can get inside the mind of Christ, to use St. Paul's phrase. We have the mind of Christ, he said. Well, I don't see much evidence of that when I listen to preachers who always talk about religion, as I would say, from the outside and uh, try to mesmerize people by repetition and stagecraft very often and over enthusiasm and emotionalism and all the tricks of the trade of the of the preacher um i i do think that uh the spiritual understanding of magic is very important but we've got to understand what we mean by magic it, it has so many meanings alistair crowley used to spell it with a K at the end because he wanted it to refer to the ancient principle. And the ancient principle is that in the beginning of civilization, religion and science were one thing. So man's knowledge of the cosmos had an inherently devotional character. It had an inherently scientific character. It was about the truth of things. And that's what we're really after, is the truth of things. I raise, as many others have, the issue of magic because the truth of things has become too narrow. And I think with that, our freedom becomes narrow and our imagination gets narrower and we become, instead of an enlightened people, we end up becoming a bigoted people. And I think a lot of the opposition to esotericism is bigotry of one kind or another. People have made their money and their reputation out of espousing um, certain points of view which earn them an income uh, you know and a place in society and status well those people are always going to be nervous if if another th- another kid comes on the block with a different right. view <laughs> <laughs> they they want to give him a good kicking and put him in his place or her in her place so uh, the church has been authoritarian it tends to interfere with people's privacy and their own lives. It tends to doubt whether people are capable of making moral decisions by themselves. Um, I, I think we have the power to be gods, but we don't activate it, and I don't think the church wants us to. I think it wants us to keep us on our knees, uh, and in the Islamic thing, even lower than that, you know, kiss the dirt. Um, the great almighty is looking down and he, he doesn't like you very much really uh, unless you do this, 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 this and this and so on there's a great lack of faith in man I don't know about faith in God uh, whether that exists or what it means but I am concerned that the faith in man is under attack in the modern world we don't, we're not believing in ourselves and magic was always saying we have within us the divine spark if we but tend it and cultivate it. We can do great acts. Call those miracles, call those magic, call it science. It doesn't matter. Where, what's the root of it is the divine imagination within us. And the cultivation of that is what I understand by the word magic. And it, because it needs this spiritual content which science has thrown out and which largely the churches have too. Their understanding of spirit is very materialistic. They talk about passing on the Holy Spirit by hand. Uh, you know, in a way, it's almost su- sort of quasi-magnetic theory that I can. God, give me your head, son. I, you know, I will confess your sins. Well, obviously, if somebody confesses one their their sins in public, they're going to have a very emotional experience, aren't they? I mean, given the build-up around them and so forth, and they're going to go, oh, God, you know, they have ecstasies, the temporary ecstasies. Uh, but these all, these things are just, they are actually, uh, they are actually a form of magic. <laughs> Preachers are using magic. They're using mind power. They're using willpower. They're using persuasive te- techniques, which can be quite easily classed as magic by a a proper understanding of magic which is to will something to happen that's what magic is is having the will and it's the cultivation of that will which is the aim of the esoteric life now occult paris was a period where there's a sort of last guard attempt before the monolith of western materialism um predominated obviously hitler uh his influence on the development of thought has been terrible. I mean, there are so many things that he, much of his destructive power is still going on because, for example, I'm giving the example of Germany after the war. Um, 
religion was looked down on very much by the state because it was seen as an irrational thing. And they thought Hitler had come to power because somehow the normally rational Germans had thrown reason out the window and embraced irrational beliefs. So there was a great fear of the irrational, so that everything becomes logical. And that paranoia of the imagination has spread, curiously enough, worldwide. So uh, especially in Western uh, Western experience, we are, we are, the West is going through a psychological nervous breakdown at the moment. Uh, and there is a, there is in that the possibility of a reintegration, which I very much want to see, where we start to reintegrate our ideas of knowledge in the confidence of our own freedom to do so. And I do believe we're going to come through it. And I do believe what I'm doing is part of what's going to get us there. Well, let's do this. We need to take a break. We'll come back. Uh, I have a question for you regarding your beliefs uh, that, that you kind of piqued my interest with earlier. But then I want to get into some of the rich characters through history that you cover in this book and how employing these ideas and, and uh, imaginations affected them and what, what we can see through history using that. We'll do that when we return. We've got so much more coming your way right here on Beyond the Darkness. Beyond the Darkness. We're back here on the Best in Paranormal Talk Radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. You can find us here on Podcast One five days a week, Monday through Friday. Tune in as we talk about the strange and supernatural. And hopefully open your mind, educate, enlighten, and entertain you while we do so. Uh, remember, right after today's show, stay tuned for a clip from today's True Crime Tuesday episode. It's a really good episode. You guys are going to love this. If you haven't already signed up, it's very easy. Go to darknessradio.com. Click on the True Crime Tuesday banner. Subscribe now. It'll give you access to all of the past episodes that we've put out, and it'll give you access to every new episode. We put out four brand new True Crime episodes every month. And on those special months when magic aligns itself and the moon is right and there's a fifth Tuesday, you'll get an additional episode at no extra cost. It's just a little gift from the cosmos to you. Only $5 a month. That's just a buck and a quarter per episode, less than a cup of coffee, and you can get some of the best in uh, True Crime Talk Radio. So make sure you go sign up now. Just go to darknessradio.com, click on the True Crime banner, and subscribe, and never miss another minute of the best in True Crime Talk Radio. And remember, there's a little clip of that right after today's episode. Occult Paris, the lost magic of the Belle Epoque. Our guest is Tobias Churton. And um, Tobias, in the first segment, you mentioned something that with your own rationale and thinking, that... <laughs> Sometimes you're challenging your own belief systems. And I, I'm just curious, what aspects of this are you, do you believe in that you find uh, almost irrational for yourself to believe in? Is there, if that question makes sense to you? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm always self-critical, autocritical about any belief. It has to go through a, uh, it has to go through a whole process for me to give it credence. Um, because this is an area, I mean, as in all areas of knowledge, the capacity for error of the human mind is enormous, including mine. So uh, just because I b think I seize on an idea, oh, I like that, that's only the beginning of the process. I then, it then, I then have to live with that idea and see how it works out in, partly in practice. Some things you can practice, some things uh, are, are beyond the scope of that. But you know, always keep one's mind open, but not so wide open that you're <laughs> like an empty space. Um, you have to deal with the wind that comes in, not just feel it. Uh, I, so, yeah, there are there are aspects that I, I for example, spiritualism, um, that is called spiritualism, uh, perhaps it should be called spiritism. Uh, the idea that the dead are sort of queuing up to chat with us, uh, and, uh, but only through <laughs> recognized mediums. I, I've, I'm very suspicious of this, uh, but I, I you know, I've, I, 
that sort of thing. That that would that would that but would challenge isn't it my interesting? rationality. Uh, most mediums say we have this ability; we just haven't learned to develop it ourselves. That's what I find really fascinating about that. I know a lot of people believe that it's again. Well, if you want to speak to the dead, you have to come through me. You have to hear what I have to say. My spirit guides, my my uh, angels, whatever you want to call them, will come forth and bring forth the dead, so that we can have these these encounters and these conversations. But I think it's really interesting that most of them believe that we all have this ability. And I think at one time or another, even for the doubters, there are connections that we cannot explain, right? There are things we know. There are knowings when somebody in your family is hurt or perhaps has passed on and you haven't even gotten the word yet. We have these kind of inner connections. So maybe the idea that we all are spiritually linked and we all do have this ability, but we're so caught up in our own theologies, belief systems, and doubt, self-doubt, that that may be what's creating the biggest issues for us making that connection in spiritism, as you yep. brought it up. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you're probably right. I think I said the other week to somebody that my my life really was the conflict between reason and intuition played out in the sphere of feeling <laughs> and sensation. So if I, 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 I hear both sides uh, of, of this, and uh, I think I you know, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than a dreamt of in your philosophy, is a very proper attitude. We shouldn't, uh, I don't think for a minute I understand the cosmos. Um, my earliest intuitions for, from my childhood, which I count very highly because they weren't, they didn't go through the filter of education, was that the world was spiritual and that, that I was linked as an individual to something far greater than I knew and I, I was aware of that from at least the age of five and I've always felt spiritual in that sense I haven't had any link with with people who are dead I, I you know my my mum died a few years ago and I, I would sorely and dearly wish that we could carry on our conversation but it is not the case and I, my feeling was afterwards that she was been accepted to where she w should be and it was just bad luck for me that I that's happened and I should be you know I have to accept that I can't speak to her anymore even though I'd want to and uh, however uh, Max Heindel said that in fact you have to go through a period where the lake of your consciousness has to level out again and become still and then you might be able to have a communication of some kind uh, there are things now, when, that happen. When that was said, yeah. are they saying we, we, the living, have to walk through that lake of consciousness to get evened out, or the spirit, yeah, once it that, leaves our form, no, has no, to do that? Well, yeah, that's another point. You know, what happens to them? Right. <laughs> you know, what happens to us? Because we're all going there, if there is a there to go to. I was also very struck by something Jakob Burma, the German mystic, he died in 1624, said in one of his question and answer books, which were hugely influential uh, uh, in the 17th century and 18th century particularly. And um, especially among founding fathers of the United States, they would have been familiar with. Anyway, one of the things he says, he says, when you die, you don't go anywhere. He said, this is, th there's nowhere to go. You're not in space and time. So all the, the spirit of man is still the spirit of man. It is we who are animated in the world of the natural law of time and space. We go places. The spirit doesn't have to go anywhere. It just is. And I, I was always rather struck by that because we find that almost impossible to conceive of because we think that means, well, that means well, I'd stay here, i.e. where I'm sitting in this chair or where you're sitting in your chair. Um, that's not what it's about at all. The spirit isn't anywhere. <laughs> that's the difficulty. And that's one of the difficulties we have with the whole scientific uh, worldview. In the scientific worldview, you are always triangulated somewhere. You are locatable. Everything is locatable. I pick up my glasses or a piece of paper, my hand touches it, can be measured, distance, movement. In the spiritual conception of uh, uh, the spiritual existence, space and time simply do not operate uh, in any sense that we understand them. And that is why there is this sort of mismatch between the two worldviews and the scientific one which we are destined to adhere to in this world because it's this world we're living in, uh, it, it cannot accommodate 
Well, it, at the moment, I mean, there are theories, of course, other dimensions where multidimensional possibilities might exist. Uh, but in, in, for most of us, we, we find the notion of the spiritual um, beyond our intellection. It's, it's, it's beyond thought. And a lot of people are quite happy with that. You know, that's what they'd call faith, saying, well, I don't understand it, but I know it's there. And I, I feel that too, and always have, you know, yeah, a, a dear old friend who's now dead said to me once, you know, if we were meant to know, we'd be told, which is always rather nice, because in a way, our lives here would become impossible if we were absolutely certain. Um, you know, it, this kind of certainty would be very dangerous. I'm fascinated by these people who brainwashed these suicide bombers who are brainwashed into an absolute certainty that they are going to go straight from pressing the button to some sort of beautific heaven specially made for them. I mean, the, the ludicrousness of it doesn't occur to them. They've been brain. That's what brainwashing is, is, is an inability to ask questions about what you're talking about. That's brainwashing. Uh, we have to ask questions about what we're doing. And I would say further again, if you're going to, entertain spiritual beliefs you must also entertain the questioning attitude i think to stay sane and balanced in this world you know otherwise you know otherwise you're in danger of, of 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 taking a trip on your own imagination and as somebody once said a journey through the unreal is an unreal journey you've wasted your time and probably got very dizzy when you get back and confused so I do think we're given all these faculties, including a rational faculty, and we have to harmonize them through progressive, uh, sort of honest living. Now, I think conventional religion is quite good, really, at doing that, i.e. bringing people slowly, slowly towards an acceptance of God and, and the divine. Um, that's one of the reasons why I would not say you should have to choose between you know, being a Rosicrucian or something and, and being, and following the church you were brought up in or something like this. When I go to church now, I actually understand better what's being said than the guy in the pulpit usually. <laughs> uh, and I have to just keep that to myself. Um, let's, let's start to examine some of the, the people that you cover in the book as well and how they, you know, I mean, obviously many of them very intelligent, articulate, uh, and creative. Was it the chicken before the egg? Was it that they were that way which made them who they were? Or was it the exploration and open-mindedness of the occult and fascination with the imagination and our possibilities that made them more creative? Well, I, I, I think the, the occult philosophy, esoteric philosophy, mm -hmm. t tends to appeal and ought to appeal to very, very intelligent people who have, as it were, come to a limit with their rational faculties. These aren't people who, are, who embracing, you know, daily hor horoscopes got nothing better to do. These are people who've looked at the world philosophically and scientifically and said, yeah, but there's something missing. And I want to know, and I'm going to put my intellect at the service of finding out what that is and i'm gonna there was one of the main figures i deal with is stanislas de Gaeta, who was a lovely uh, interesting man brought up uh, near nancy in france um who came to paris as a poet and uh wanted to meet the intellectuals studied at the sorbonne in paris and started to gather as much technical information on the history of magic and the occult and the esoteric and alchemy as he could. And he produced some marvelous books, which have never been translated into English, like so many interesting French books that don't get translated. Um, we're really very systematic. So he was trying to produce a library for the extra enlightenment. I do think this field is sort of like it's extra in a way. It's not... It would be interesting. You can't really teach the depth of it in schools particularly because a great, a great maturity is necessary to deal with these concepts uh, and, and a progressive awareness of, of information. I, I, while a small child might have the essence in the sort of Jesus sense of suffer the little children unless he be as these, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. A childlike receptiveness is very important. A sense of play also is very important. A sense of innocence is very important. And especially don't be a smart ass. Um, 
I think the the smart ass attitude is doesn't go doesn't sit well with these studies. Oh, great. But uh, uh, yeah, exactly, there is hope. There's hope for Dang us all. It. Yeah, but it's, it's difficult to quite answer your question about um, about individuals because there were, there were quite a few of them, and and they all had they're all very individual lives. Um, I'm very fond of Josephin Peladin. Peladin was a, a man who. Um, revolutionized thinking about art and organized the first Rosicrucian Salon in 1892 in Paris, which was an amazing popular hit. Streets were closed, people coming to see this art, which was inspired by spiritual sensibility. And he launched a whole series of artists, Felicien Rops, uh, Fernand Knopf, and many others uh, uh, who, who otherwise wouldn't have had a showing and a hearing uh, because the French uh, official Salon dominated thinking about art. And he launched a new aesthetic which flowered, funnily enough, in abstract art and surrealism. Uh, people took his ideas and developed them, took them a few stages further. Now, he, he got his free, mental freedom from uh, opening his mind to the highest, as he would put it. So the aim of man is to become perfect. It's a, we are to be things of beauty. We should start to move towards becoming gods and we should have the profound self-respect that that's where we're heading and he was a great one you know being a platonist truth beauty goodness being the three principles which connect us with god truth beauty and goodness uh we might be truthful but we must also be beautiful and if we're beautiful we're more likely to be good and so on these three principles goodness truth beauty interact and they help the mind to develop in the most fruitful and divine direction. Um, Protestantism has very little to say about beauty. It's even it's even critical. It's suspicious of beauty. Its femininity might corrupt. Um, uh, people who are interested in beauty are not serious about the serious business of working hard, making money, and all the rest of it. Um, but I think, and, and that's uh, Oscar Wilde didn't go down all that well in most of America when he came over in the 1890s for that reason, because aesthetics, the, the culture of America at that time wasn't ready for aestheticism. It was too busy scratching a living from hard earth and still in the pioneering stage. Uh, perhaps now it's moving to a more reflective period of history where, where people have time to consider these things uh, in depth. Though my knowledge of American history is that there have always been people in America who've been onto this. Uh, my n uh, book that comes out later in the year deals specifically with American history. Um, and of course, America and Paris, we're talking about Paris, were very close in those days. Um, in the 1890s, things that went on in Paris were almost automatically reported in New York uh, and Washington. Uh, so there was as much, and um, they didn't have the internet, but we, we they weren't bloody helpless either. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't take long for information to spread because we were dealing with great empires and great power bases, and they, they all wanted to know. Um, so the influence of this Paris movement wasn't confined to Paris. It was also uh, setting off seeds in, in London and, and Moscow, St. Petersburg, and New York. And, uh, in fact, across America, too, the people began to hear of it. And uh, so what we're dealing with now is, it was, we're, trying to remember, we're trying to raise that uh, awareness because I think the, the movement that started in Paris is still going. Uh, we wouldn't be having this discussion. The idea so that, that, I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that I always like to get to the original. I like to get to the source, to the right. spring, where the, water, where the water tastes good. Paris was such a creative moment in this spirit. It helps to know about it because it inspires us to do our own thing today. You've got all of these great thinkers that are coming together. They're, they're looking at these things. They're exploring them open-mindedly, open-heartedly to try to really absorb the, the possibilities of what goes on. As, as they did this, were there aspects that they would come to agree were not practical and, and most likely were nothing more than imagination and would never be realizations uh, and, and other ones that maybe they were more surprised by, uh, other other ideas that, that would come to fruition that seemed to have these roots in, in magic or, you know, the, the unexplainable? I think that I think the, the the one thing that came out of the movement that's most lasting is the influence on 
freedom of man as an artist, to see man primarily as an artist, I think that was very much uh, part of the movement. But that actually divided the uh, the movement in Paris at the time, and there were those who said, uh, you know, this is all too subjective. We're not we, we we're not here just to promote painters. You know, we're we're trying to find out about the nature of spiritual reality. So all these debates caused divisions as well as they weren't it, that some of these debates were creative some weren't but you also had <laughs> really weird things happen like um there's a guy called abbe Boulin who was uh, ran a bizarre church called the vintrasist church um uh, uh which oh my goodness they, it was kind of they had sex magic and and um bleeding hosts. It was all going on in Lyon. It was led by a very nefarious and sinister guy called Abbe Boulin and his assistant Julie Thibault. And they set up this church and he started to he, he, he started to write to a guy called Joris um, Karl Huysmans, who, who was a famous author at the time. He wrote La Bas, which was the most successful novel in Europe at the time. And he said, these people, this Peladin, this De Gaeta, who I mentioned earlier, are poisoning me through astral fluids, which they're directing to kill me because they've decided I'm a, I'm a black magician. And in fact, De Gaeta had visited Boulin down in Lyon and decided that the guy was indeed a, a sinister person misusing occult forces uh, to get uh, power and a living from this from his church uh, but he didn't practice uh, black magic on him and he gave all the reasons why but then another writer goes into the press and says you see what these people are really up to is they're up to black magic they're sending that this poor abbe boulin down in lyon is getting thought attack well, of course, this, and then of course, Boulin dies in 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 1891, uh, leaving these letters saying it's them what have killed me. You know, he, he died of a normal disease. Um, so, yes, <laughs> what practices were not approved of in this movement? <laughs> de- uh, it, that's the kind of thing. The idea of uh, trying to destroy, uh, de- trying to use it for 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 bad. Uh, for ill, trying to trying to develop powers to destroy people was definitely frowned upon, and because it was against the principle of of the liberty of the individual soul. Uh, if a person makes a grave for themselves through their own stupidity, that's one thing. Pushing them into it is another. You know, it's what what is called the primrose path. If a person's gaily going towards destruction and they're willful and they, you can't stop them. You perhaps the best thing you can do is let them carry on, but that's not the same as pushing them down there or encouraging it. So, in that sense, there was quite a strong Christian element to the movement. I think most of the leading uh, members were Catholics, and while they were banned, uh, their 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 main organ, the l'initiation, uh, the initiation, which was their magazine, was actually banned by the the index in in Rome. Uh, most of them kept to the moral principles they'd been raised on as children, that love was God's gift of Holy Spirit, and without love you couldn't achieve anything. So it's a, it's a white magic movement. But they weren't afraid at all of the word occult. That simply meant what science did, as you said earlier, that's what science didn't know yet. So um, <clears throat> I, I, I got into this personally through the music of Debussy, which I first heard when I was... 15 and I was transfixed by it and I, it just made me think of uh, I, I just got visions from listening to La Cathedrale Anglouti, it's very weird, the other day I was watching a YouTube thing, it was Frank Sinatra being interviewed by Johnny Carson back in about 68 and Carson says something like, uh, what kind of music do you think I should be playing uh, I often play your music, Frank, when I, I've, I've got a girl on the sofa and we're, we're, we're courting. <laughs> and he said, so I want to know, Frank, what do you listen to? And Frank realized, you know, he, he thought he was going to say Jimi Hendrix or something. And he, he, he took a lot of drawing out on the question. Finally, Frank came out there and says, well, if you really want to know what I listen to when I want to get inspired, I listen to, uh, to Daphne and Chloe, that's Ravel, uh, and uh, La Cathedrale Anglouti. By Debussy. And I thought, Frank, I always knew it, mate. <laughs> yeah. How do we get into this thought world? How do we get into this imagination, imaginative freedom? It can come through a piece of music. And I, I think Debussy's time spent in the company of Edmond Bailly and, um, and Peladin 
and uh, De Gaeta and their friends was hugely influential on his sensitivity. He's often called an impressionist composer, which is total nonsense. He was a symbolist. And this movement I'm talking about is also uh, goes hand in hand with the movement of what's called symbolism, which is a, an art art movement in itself where you try to find the inner core of the thing and then give it form uh, the, the spiritual core a bit like a religious icon you go through the image to find its essential divine truth that's the, that's the whole principle of this is reintegrating man with the higher level and it's weird that the word occult has come to mean something dark and everything right. but you know the, this word darkness even which we have the symbolism in the New Testament, in, in John's, the letter of John, for example, you know, darkness is compared to evil, for there is no light in him, you know, that line. Um, but act, there, there, there is another aspect of darkness. Um, the phrase, the solitary darkness of God, the darkness which fills the Holy of Holies when the, the, um, the ark was brought there and the staves were removed from the ark. And the room is filled with this dense smoke. And there's some wonderful pieces in the Psalms that God dwells in this darkness. Uh, and there's the line in Freemasonry in the third degree where he's, uh, it was the one about, um, oh, what is it? Um, it, was, it was parodied as an anti-Masonic thing. about. Uh, oh, it's, it's, it's just left me afraid at that moment. Um, but basically, it's, it's, it's this darkness is at light to us because not we don't know god it is a darkness to us uh, but what little we can know is light so uh, darkness made visible you know that's the fi- line in freemasonry about the darkness that's made visible right. well and i, and and I, I firmly believe that yeah. as as we've named both of our shows based on this topic with the word darkness incorporated and it was funny the the concept you know how people do automatically kind of assess the word darkness and, and assume it means evil and that if I'm doing a paranormal show uh, called Darkness on the Edge of Town or, or uh, you know, Darkness Radio, we must be evil. And I always thought, no, the, the real learning is in the darkness because it's where we have not been before, right? And that... It's where... Uh, right, it's, it's where, where the are. knowledge exists, <laughs> right? It's, it's where you need to go and in order to light your way, you need to continue into the darkness, learning what's there, learning and educating yourself about these different aspects and topics. And, you know, here, here you bring up a guy that really inspired you for this work and then you find a link with Frank Sinatra and you find people <laughs> like this that have, right? I mean, almost a magic about them. You look at Frank Sinatra and I, I'm a, I'm fascinated. I love Frank Sinatra, big fan. Uh, even beyond the the horrific stories we've heard of him, just who he was and the dynamic of who he was. And I I read these biographies of of famous m- musicians and artists and and uh, actors, comedians, and I find this common thread that it's always the most unlikely of people who make these magic points happen because it's their belief, it's their want and desire. And and that is what calling on the occult is, right? It's 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 creating this magic that already exists and just pulling it to, you know, instead of pulling ourselves up to the table, we're pulling the table up to us and we're accessing these these aspects now. So you you look at people like Frank Sinatra, this skinny little goofy looking kid with a voice that was really not yeah. much different than anybody else at his time, and he became yeah. a legend. And these yeah. artists and writers who open up that creative spark and allow themselves to become a conduit so that the information's coming through them. That's, that is magic, right? I mean, isn't that exactly what Yeah, of what course it is. Of course right? it is. Right. That's the whole point. That's what people don't get, you know. Right. It, magic isn't just a bunch of theory. It's about living more, uh, with complete inspiration. It's about transformative, transformative mind. You know, how many people have been turned on by the Beatles or the Beach Boys when Brian Wilson was, was in charge and so on? The, the these people were using magic. Bob Dylan is actually he's on record as saying that he couldn't write the songs he wrote in the sixties anymore because he said he, he used a kind of magic and he can't, he says he can't use it now. What that magic was, it was his magic. For all I know, it was uh, some very good grass or something. I've no idea. But the point <laughs> is, he, the point is, he turned his mind on to something that was not normal. Now and that frightens people. That's the fear. The fear is that, but, and that's why people are also frightened of genuinely 
godlike powers. They're quite happy going to church because they know nothing's ever going to happen. You know, all the words are spoken, but it doesn't happen, does it? You know, it doesn't happen. What people are afraid of is that someday, you know, it might happen. Maybe you can divide a loaf into 4,000, you know. <laughs> what if that happened? Maybe they wouldn't just say, hey, it's divided loaf. Maybe they'd run scared if they saw that. I, I feel that about when I, re- as you said, when you read the Bible, that and the New Testament, I presume particularly, you were talking about it read like a book of magic to you. Right. I, think, I think that's exactly right. And the real question was, what was the source of the magic? Now, the, the, the Sanhedrin accused Jesus of using the power of the devil. They said he, he's the de- he couldn't do these things without the devil. So he was obviously doing things that were coming from another dimension of experience and they were afraid of what that would do to them their power over the people and you have the same with the churches today whose power and they say in whose name are you doing this and and he calls them your father you are the because you lie you tell me your father is the father of lies i do the truth and i tell you my power is from my father and then he says, you too can do these things, greater, th- greater things than these you should do. Now, when I look at the amazing things we can do now, I mean, you and I having this conversation. I'm sitting here in Staffordshire, England. You're sitting there in, is, did you say Minnesota? Yes, Minneapolis, right. You're in Minneapolis. I mean, isn't this incredible? You know, if this was happening, oh, only a few years ago, it would, of course, we'd say, my God, that's magic. The natural thing. Magic is perhaps just an emotion, emotive way of describing that we've hit on an inspired invention. But where does the invention come from? Reason cannot create these inventions because reason can only work on what it knows already. Now, in order to get true inspiration, something new has to come in. Where does it come from? It's not just the product of logic. We very rarely get, you can't write a, you know, John Lennon used to talk about the difference between craftsmanship writing and inspired writing. He said, I love to be inspired. In other words, he says, then it, it's not even necessarily me who wrote it. I've, something comes through me. It's painful to deal with. Those are the songs that really have it. He said, but yeah, I can sit down. I can make the chords work and I can do a tune and all this. He said, I call that craftsmanship writing. But that's, he said, that's not what he's here for. And that's the difference. Science is like the craftsmanship writing. Magic is the inspirational stuff. And we need both. These should be walking hand in hand. But, you know, you put your hand, if I put my hand out to science, uh, I get a, I once had a scientist writer in England, famous one. Uh, I went to a salon and when he heard me talking about Gnostics and that, he made the sign of the cross. (laughs) You know, like, don't corrupt my pure science. Lewis Lewis Wolpert with your, with your mumbo jumbo. And, you know, there are, there are narrow-minded signs. But then I met another guy who was an astrophysicist at the University of Sheffield, and he said, hell, he said, I've got the easy job as a scientist. All I'm doing is measuring things. He said, you're dealing with, you're dealing with, he said, the theologian's got a much more difficult task. He's dealing with questions which there are no obvious answers. Why does love decay, for example? He said, I can't work that out in an equation. I can't give you the science of that. Or the mystery of death as a mystery, you know. I can't, I can only say this has happened. This function is not working as far as we can see. And so we, inside your science looks at the mechanics. Do you know that phrase, as far as we can see? Right. You know, I just used it naturally then. As far as I can see, so and so. Science gives us as far as we can see. Mm -hmm. Now, the supposition behind the esoteric is man has the capacity to go beyond what he, he can see. And in fact, not only does he have the capacity, we use it all the time. It's, it, the, the brain is a wonderful thing and it, it can harness insights that, you know, are, are staggering to the individual which come as a kind of revelation to individuals. A lot of people think, my God, yeah, I must be, you know, when they actually have a, a moment of, of epiphany, as we say, they can overwhelm the ego and they think, I'm bloody special. You know? But actually, I think these sort of epiphanies are happening all the time all around the world and we just suppress them because we're fri- frightened of talking about them. Or um, I remember talking to my dad once and said, you know, about visions and i said i think i'm beginning to understand what vision is and he said he said to me those aren't things we talk about toby you know <laughs> and, 
And that was a double meaning, isn't it? On the one hand, it means you should respect those things and hold them in your heart, as we used to, would say. But on the other, there was a slight implication that if you do talk about them, they'll think you're crazy. Right. And, you know, and, and craziness is, has always been regarded as a disease and something that will mark a person out. If you want to dismiss a person, you just say, ah, oh, they're crazy. I've heard this all my life when I was at Oxford. You know, they didn't like an idea. Oh, that's crazy. And I was always one of the kind of people who said, ah, I wonder if they are crazy. I'll look into that. And when I found that the thought world that, that interested me, this Gnostic tradition, Gnosis, uh, so much, that it was so roundly condemned, so universally attacked, both from science and religion, and, and of course, that by linking my work to it, it would have an effect on me personally. I People might judge me as, as somebody lacking in insight or intelligence or anything, frankly, sanity. Uh, was I going to take that step and do it? Well, I felt I should. And uh, it's been a wonderful thing um, to, to, to have the privilege to, to have, have walked that path, difficult as it is. But it does take a certain amount of courage. But what a lot of things do. We should be courageous. What, what's life for if we haven't proved ourselves worthy of, the, of, the, of the, our best thoughts? And I'm, you know, we're not doing anybody any harm. I'm, <laughs> the whole idea is to right. expand. Well, it's, it's funny. Even science, who slaps you down and says that's crazy, you, you yeah. brought up the fact that a lot of the biggest leaps and changes in our world were from crazy thoughts. And I, you know, I watched a, a program regarding. Um, medical science and, and some of the different crazy thoughts that went on. And the guy that I, I always thought this was just a fascinating deal. This, this scientist, and I wish I could remember his name. This doctor came up with the idea that ulcers were actually a bacteria and that mm -hmm. the reason people were dealing with this and we were treating the wrong things. And he would go in and talk about the fact that this is caused by a bacteria. If we treat it with an antibiotic and we treat it this way, it will heal on its own. You're, you're crazy. This is ridiculous. And they mocked him openly in, in a scientific forum in front of other scientists whose ideas are always about thinking beyond what we know, challenging those principles and seeing if there's anything that comes back. And this guy proved his point. He was eventually vindicated in the fact that ulcers were created and, and caused by these bacteria and, and they could be fought and done. And, and what we were doing in a lot of cases to quote unquote cure that was only creating it and making it worse. And here you've got a, a scientific principle, even shutting out science and, and not allowing that forward thinking. It's, it's so strange to realize that most of the greatest challenges and things that we've made come from these moments of inspiration. And you were talking about the fact that, you know, they're there and, and listen to how many people will say, man, you know, I had the idea for that 10 years ago. Why didn't I act on it? Now that guy's a millionaire. And it is, <laughs> it's, it's not that we're, any one of us is any more magical than the other. It's who acts upon the inspiration and, yes. and takes that, that becomes the, the magic, right? It's, isn't, isn't that, didn't Jesus yeah. have that in the parable about the guy he left the, the money with and the one right. who just came, you know, came back and said, yeah, here's your money back. He said, no, no, I didn't give it to you so you could give it me back. You've got to make more out of it. We are, it is a, it should be a divine commission to everyone who claims to be Christian or influenced by Christianity, to take the faculties they've been given and double, treble, quadruple their capacities. It's a duty to do that. It's not just even an option. It's, it's part of what being human should be about. And when you see people who haven't done that, the sorry sight of people sitting around playing drafts all afternoon, I always think of that scene in Easy Rider. Do you remember the movie Easy Rider? Do yes. you see that? Yeah. yeah. Do you remember they go into that awful bar? Uh, towards the end of the film, and there's these rednecks sitting around, uh, and they start commenting on these strange men who've walked in. And they say, that he's got hair like a girl, laughing's like gorilla, and all this shit. And, and you realize those are people who've simply never taken any steps to develop themselves. They've, they've simply absorbed the immediate culture around them, reproduced it, and because there's enough of them to get together a posse to bash their heads out of these these so-called, you know, freaks, 
uh, that then they're strong. And I think that's the state of most humanity, to be perfectly honest, is they're living like, you know, <laughs> the joke about evolution, about this thing developed from the apes is, when I look at a large part of undeveloped humanity, they're so obviously ape-like that the apes look intelligent to me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's perfectly obvious that many people are, de- are de- descended from subhumans because the, their attitudes are so subhuman. Now, those attitudes aren't confined to uneducated um, uh, people in, uh, you know, in uh, backwards places where you, you could go to a backwards place and find somebody who's amazingly well read. And I have done, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's not that. It's whether they're bothered to develop themselves. Now, all we're talking about and your whole thing about beyond the darkness is we're trying to get beyond the darkness. Right. But if you don't, if you don't accept this darkness, you ain't gonna, you, you can't even start because you won't even realize you need a light. Carl Jung, the depth psychologist said, you know, people think that I've, you know, opened up the unconscious to science. He said, no, he said, I just shone a few lights into what is at the moment an absolute mystery, the human mind. He says, I don't understand the human mind. If I'd been able to contribute a little bit by putting this light in, and maybe that's something we can go on to help us understand this mystery uh, of, the, which, of this darkness we live in, then I'll have done a good turn. But the the fact of the matter is, in, in spiritually speaking, we are in darkness, and we need this light. And the occult light is that which has been hidden from us, which is there to – it's not there to be hidden. It's there to be revealed. And, and that this is – you know, and that, that's that's – well, that's what we're saying. For right. No, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. And that's right. I think people feel a comfort in being accepted, whether you're being accepted in a group because this is, you know, people fear to get out of that comfort zone. And I would rather sit with these redneck morons because together we're strong. That's the false perception that they're in. than expand my mind and give me the possibility of believing outside of this or having maybe somebody heckle me. And, and in, in, truth a lot of people that have been heckled for their beliefs end up exceeding even their wildest dreams right isn't isn't that even what going back to sinatra he said the best revenge is success right yeah for those that I, you, I, i'm yeah. glad you like sinatra because I'm, I'm a very big fan of frank sinatra in in every sense i i don't think it's just that he had a voice he must have had a very very fascinating inner life as well you know going on at the same time as all the other temptations that were around him due to his position in in society and in the entertainment world so on but i do think there's a true true art a true art and true magic in his voice i think he's one i think he's one of the great singers since the medieval troubadours um he lights my fire anyway no, I, agree, I agree with you there's something and when you hear people like that that are at the peak of what they do and, yeah, almost and, beyond the human. Isn't it? Yeah. Right. It, it, it takes you to another place. You know, another person like that for me has always been Bruce Springsteen, although, you know, you wouldn't listen and think there's this magnetic voice, this this uh, deal, but there's a resonance to it and a truth that when you listen, you can apply it. And, I, you know, I've said on the shows I was at the darkest point of my life when I was a teenager and, you know, for, for that point of our life again because the unknown was out there and – suicide was where I was going to go, but it was listening to the music of Bruce Springsteen that saved my life because wow. I heard I, I was in this isolationist moment of depression when all that matters is my thoughts, my problems, you know, how can I survive this? This is horrible. And I start listening to this music and to me, these words spoke. And, and what I heard was this guy lived through this pain. This guy has felt this and he's, now Bruce Springsteen, and he's a multimillionaire musician, and you know he's traveling the world, seeing everything. So I'm not defined by the depression. That's an aspect of who I am, but I can go beyond that and and create more from it. And that was even validated more in the release of his his biography. And he goes so beautifully in depth to his own demons and darkness that you realize that when you open up, you can connect, and it's finding these connections that open up this kind of magic Pandora's box for you, right? Because then you see the possibilities and you connect to something greater than yourself. You're outside of your ego and you yes. become, you become part of something bigger in scale. And that's when you're open to more ideas. That's when you're open to uh, magic happening. And we've, we've seen that happen in our lives. And even, you know, you brought up the fact that in church people go there, it's safe because they know they'll never see it 
occur, but we've done prayer and healing requests as a part of our show since we began in 2006, and we've seen miracles happen. Things that should not have happened occur when people come together of a like mind with the same intention, and that's magic. Sure is. That's it. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, I, can, I can only say yes to that, Dave. Uh, yes, yes, and yes again. Um, I sometimes think when I write my books, m- much of them are contain history. And, uh, people are always very quick to say, well, it's all in the past. What difference does it make now? I said, this is the record of the light right. passing through. And by looking into it, the light comes on again. And you'll realize that you're much closer to these people than you ever imagined. And you begin to feel true kinship with them, like they're your friends or your brothers or people you're very, very close to. Um, I've fallen in love with people who are long dead, you know, in, in a, not obviously in an erotic sense, but, but spiritually very, you know, real, real fellowship, mind meeting mind, wonderful experience. I, I loved being in Paris in the 1880s, 90s. I felt very much at home with these people. I found their company stimulating and, 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 I suppose the downside of that is when I, I have to leave them or close the book and I'm not walking those streets, as it were, anymore, um, I have to look at the modern world and think, well, how can I apply this? And, of course, it can then be quite distressing because the modern world didn't develop in the way they truly hoped. They thought that the world was heading for an age of Holy Spirit, you know, by which I mean a spiritual culture open to uh, open to beautiful developments of the human spirit. And we're clearly going through um, a a very, very dark period, uh, spiritually I'm talking about. And yet, you know, we're talking. People are listening. It's not all that dark. Uh, You know, there's the two kinds of darkness we've been describing. Um, There's the darkness through which you must pass to find the light. And then there's a darkness which appears to, to, to nullify the effort. But I think that darkness, which nullifies the effort, is self-created. Oh, no it's doubt. Ego- look, look at how many of yeah. the, the, the people that you've talked about, uh, artists and musicians, and even reflecting back on the life of Frank Sinatra, something magic happened. This guy, boom, blew up. And then he entered this dark period in his own mind. He created this darkness, and his career began to slip. But it was in his yes. consciousness and his mind believing that if he could play this role – uh, in from here to eternity, he gave himself the spark of of uh, inspiration again. That I need this. When I do this, it will release something in me again. And he did that that role of Maggio, and he owned it in from here to eternity. Right there was nobody else you could ever see playing that role that way. And all of a sudden, there was this rebirth of Frank Sinatra, and he would go through these periods. But you can see it in in most masters, right? That it's when they let their own. When, when they're open, they're the most successful. It's when they start buying into their own ego, buying into their own issues, that that inspiration gets quelled and they get almost shut off from it, they're like a punishment, if you will, um, because they're no longer part of a bigger thing. They become just more about themselves. And I think, again, that's a beautiful sign of what magic should be is continuing to reopen. And you said, you know, opening these books and seeing that light back at the other end of the tunnel. And realizing that it's always been there, we can continue that light, and it's in how we approach our own lives and utilizing that magic. We're not waving magic wands or singing incantations to open that up, but in a sense, it's that magic still exists, and we just have to figure out how to continue to reapply it and and continue to not cut ourselves off from source, but figure out ways to take ourselves higher into it. For sure. I think we've got to get our hands on the means of production. <laughs> right. You know, we, this is a, uh, at the moment we're, we're, we're still foundering in a kind of consumerist culture where somebody else is providing everything. Right. And, uh, and, and of course the quality is very poor and the philosophy that goes with it is extremely dull. And the satisfactions that come are, are, are of a non-spiritual kind. Um, the right. development Give a man a fish, he, he eats for a day. Teach a man to fish, he'll eat for life. That's that parable still effective today, right? I mean, pure magic. They're, pure they're, magic. They're yeah. giving us garbage, <laughs> but there's no sense of accomplishment like doing it and getting your hands dirty and being a part of 
recreating that magic. So I think, yeah, I, I'm, it's fascinating. And I'm glad that somebody like you can put together a book like this where you take an interesting history and an interesting point in history with these minds and these these wonderful people that had the imagination to believe beyond what we were being told in the four walls of school and that 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 life is about more than just reciting and rhetoric it's about living and it's about opening up yeah so i applaud you great book fascinating topic and uh, you know we'd love to have you back with us more in the future tobias if you're open to uh, revisiting with us i think openness is the theme of this talk and the answer is yes (laughs) excellent Well, check it out. We'll have a link up for the book, Occult Paris, The Lost Magic of the Belle Epoch. Tobias Churton, our guest today, and uh, a fascinating discussion. I'd love to hear from you guys. Give me an email, dave at darknessradio.com. What do you think about these principles? Where in your life do you see that when you were the most open, that you were the most successful? And when you would see these moments of darkness, was it when you began to close off from the rest. And and I think that's when, when you might shut down. I'd like to hear if you've had that happen in your life or the opposite. What are your theories and beliefs? Email me and share those ideas with us. Let's keep the conversation going. Dave at darknessradio.com, the best way to reach me. We'll, uh, we'll be back again tomorrow. Joyce Keller will be here helping us bridge the gap. Are we all capable of communicating with the other side? And what do they have to tell us from the other side? What is life, death, and the beyond. We'll discuss that in depth tomorrow. Stay tuned. We've got a clip from today's True Crime Tuesday. I appreciate you being here with us. Till tomorrow, be kind, love one another, be nice, and we'll be back with more Beyond the Darkness. Hello and welcome. It's Tuesday and time to look into the True Crime Tuesday catalog for today. The book we'll be discussing consumed almost the perfect murder. Our guest for the evening, Deanna Klo. Welcome to True Crime Tuesday, Deanna. Thank you for being here tonight. Hi, thank you so much for having me. All right, so you get the word that his wife passed away. And how how, how did she suppose it, or how did she die uh, from what they're telling you at this point? Well, uh, when I sat there and I was in obvious obviously shocked and crying, I said, um, you know, I, I will help you in any way I can to, to find justice for her, whether it's Keith or anyone else that's done this. And um, at that point, they didn't really share how she died with me. You know, they just said that she died in the, their home. And so I went undercover for the next week and recorded conversations with Keith. Um, and he still continued with the ex wife scenario. Um, so that's all playing in your favor because he's he's right. following the same script he's played with you since the start. Right, right. You know, and how okay. he can't wait to see me. And, right. <clears throat> and he's trying to, you know, settle the insurance on the home. And <clears throat> Now, is and, he uh, aware that you have been spoken to by the police? No, no, he okay. didn't know. So when they ask who's Deanna Klo and he informs him a drinking buddy, to him that was the end of the story. Right, right. Now, were these he conversations, didn't know, he didn't know that. these conversations, these undercover communicados that you were having, were they ever in person or was it always by text and phone? It was by text and phone because he was in Paducah trying to do the funeral and all the arrangements with the family. Okay. Are are the police, uh, when when they're talking to you about this, are they conveying to you, we think Keith had a hand in this because he was trying to fix it for you? Do you, do you, you know, were, were they kind of leading you on to believe that, that there might be murder involved in this? Or what? how exactly are they explaining this to you? They didn't implicate Keith, but they did say... Um, they expected foul play. Okay. Um, what came out um, was that she was shot three times before the fire. Mm. Yeah. She was killed. She was shot three times before the fire. Now, what happened was she was, it came down within five minutes he like he almost got away with it because had she been cremated um and there not been an autopsy then he would have gotten away with it um 
that she was shot three times before, and the autopsy revealed that. Okay, now how, she was in a fire? How badly right. was she burned? I mean, not bad <clears throat> enough, apparently, that they could do an autopsy and find three bullet wounds. Well, this is, uh, and the coroner uh, went into great horrific detail about how she was shot. But, um, and the fire was very intense because it was, she was put in between the mattresses and burned. And, and I don't know how, because the, uh, sci- that science is not my forte, but but out of the, this is what happened. The three bullets, um, two of the bullets went straight through her body, but one bullet hung up inside her body. And that's how they knew that it was foul play. Had the third bullet went through her body, then they would have not known. Subscribe now for True Crime Tuesday by visiting darknessradio.com and clicking the True Crime Tuesday banner. Never miss another episode of True Crime Tuesday and Dumb Crimes and Stupid Criminals. Go there now, darknessradio.com, and click on the True Crime Tuesday banner. Do it now!